Hello again, fellow audiophiles. I am Wave Theory, and I am back today with part four of my Cables Matter series, where we are going to talk about pattern recognition. Now, this video is admittedly long, and I think it ended up needing to be because there's a lot of ground to cover here. I am going to introduce a completely new way of thinking within our hobby. At least, I'm pretty sure that it's new. I have scoured the internet and looked at all of the sources that I could find to see if anyone in our community, be they cable makers, speaker makers, reviewers, audiologists, etc., have thought to bring the idea of pattern recognition into the discussion about how we can perceive differences in sounds. And to my knowledge, no, that hasn't happened yet. So this is a completely new idea to our hobby, as far as I know. And if I'm not right about that, please comment in the, in the comments below and point me in the right direction because I have looked everywhere that I can think of and I haven't found it yet. So because this is likely new, I'm going to encourage you to go through this slowly, digest it piece by piece, give it a lot of thought, and definitely ruminate on it and think about it before you comment on it in the comments section below. Now, a quick reminder, we are mostly talking about analog audio cables in this series. Things like analog interconnects, be they RCA or XLR, speaker cables and headphone cables, those kinds of things. This particular part brings in some ideas that would also apply to digital cables and power cables and the like, which I can make more explicit in another video sometime in the future. But for right now, it's mostly analog that we're talking about. All right, so again, this is new. Please take time to consider it and see if it is worthwhile because I'm about to talk about one of the fundamental aspects of human cognition that I think we ignore in the debate at our own peril. All right, previ previously in this series, we did part one where we talked about intro and the nature of science and measurements. I also mentioned in part one that here in part four, I would talk about some of the pitfalls that make it difficult for us to hear uh, differences in audio cables. So I will touch on that in this video. In part two, I talked about waves and wave superposition and how when you have multiple wave signals existing in the same place at the same time, they add together and change the shape of the wave that is ultimately perceived. And then in part three, I talked about AC signal transmission. How do we get those waves through wires? And in that video, I presented a graph that looked like this where we had a fundamental frequency essentially in the red wave on top with its first harmonic the blue wave right underneath it and then the magenta wave on the bottom is the sum of those two waves how they add together and then i talked about how with cables different frequencies travel at different speeds and specifically in the audio band higher frequencies travel faster so it'd be like shifting a harmonic of a fundamental over in the time domain like this which now means that the bottom wave instead of adding like we see it on the screen adds up like this. Now I do admit that that is a small change. If we were to measure a change in microvolts there, for example, that would be a very, very small change. And the pattern to the change may not make a whole lot of sense to us. But so that begs the question, can we hear these small changes? Okay, and so that's where we're going to turn here to part four, where I'm going to talk about how pattern recognition and then a very closely related idea called framing fits in and provides an explanation for a couple of things. So in this episode, we're going to motivate the need for a different way of looking at this issue of can we hear differences in audio cables? To do that, I am going to talk about a fundamental aspect of human cognition, okay? literally how our brains work, and furthermore argue that human brains are in fact really, really good at this, 
and so good at it that our technology is still a long way from being able to truly effectively replicate it. And that's going to allow me to explain why human auditory systems can, in fact, hear differences in audio cables, while at the same time, it's going to explain how human auditory systems also sometimes miss differences in audio cables. Right, so yes, I'm going to provide some theoretical underpinnings here and use cognitive psychology science to explain both things. Why we have so many people who claim they can hear these tiny signal differences in audio cables, and then why we have so many test results that call that ability into question. Okay, I can explain both of those with this underlying theory here. So I'm gonna do that in this video. All right, so why do we need a different explanation for why we can hear cable differences than what we already have out there? Let's consider some claims that are made by cable difference deniers, i.e. people who do not believe that we can hear differences in audio cables. One of the claims they make is simply that there is no electrical difference between audio cables. Say so we've measured these and any differences that we measure are just in terms of signal noise and all of that. Well, hopefully in part three, when I presented this, I, I blew up that claim because we have known for literally decades, probably more than a century at this point, that different electrical conductive materials conduct electricity differently. They have different resistive properties. And furthermore, all of those properties change with frequency and they change with temperature and they change with not just what kind of cable material they are made of, they uh, change based on how a cable is constructed, how many conductors are in that wire, how many or how those conductors are woven together in that wire, so on and so forth. So both theoretically and from measurement perspectives, this one just cannot be true. All right. So then another claim that we hear by cable difference deniers is, okay, fine. Maybe there are electrical differences, but they are too tiny to hear. My question to them is, how do you know that? Where is that? I have been looking and looking and looking at any kind of data out there that correlates differences in microvolt signals, okay, or difference in energy levels measured in microvolts to the just noticeable difference of human hearing. I have seen some evidence and some and done some reading and found out that like we can hear sometimes as little as a half decibel sound intensity difference. We can perceive differences in tone at about a resolution of half a percent of the fundamental frequency, or I should say just of half a percent of the frequency of the tone we are hearing. But I have yet to see any data anywhere that makes any kind of correlation between measured differences in, in signal energy in microvolts or whatever that translates to a just noticeable difference threshold for sound perception. Further, as I get into pattern recognition here, I have found no evidence or no studies anywhere that give any kind of suggestion as to how much a pattern has to change before we can perceive a difference in a pattern. Okay, so the electrical differences are too tiny to hear. You're assuming that. There's actually no hard evidence as to where that threshold is. Okay, so we'll come back to that one. Another claim here is, well, okay, any differences that you hear, either because there is no electrical difference or the electrical difference is too tiny to hear, any difference that you hear is due to a bias or something like a placebo effect. Okay, well, when you put these three claims here on the screen together, it really looks to me like we're moving the goalposts here. Okay, every time we say something, we come back and say, well, maybe that's not it. The standard of uh, proof, or the standard of evidence, or the standard of reasoning seems to shift a little bit. 
So I'm, I'm going to argue this here, that none of these claims here explain why we can and cannot hear cable differences. Now, some may already be objecting to that, saying, hey, the electrical difference is being too small to hear it does explain why we can't hear the differences. And then cognitive things like biases and placebos explain why we might. Okay, now I hope I've already addressed why the electrical difference is being too tiny. I mean, we don't really know where that is, okay? But also, I'm going to explain on the next couple of slides why bias and placebo are either insufficient explanations or just flat out inappropriate uses of the term in this context. Okay, so let's look at that. Let's first define bias and placebo. Now from a scientific perspective, a bias is any trend or deviation from the truth in data collection, data analysis, interpretation, and publication which can cause false conclusions. Since there are signal differences in cables, both by theory and by measurement, even if those differences are very, very tiny, bias doesn't apply very well. And that's because if we perceive a difference and there is a difference, the bias is actually in saying that there would not be a perceptible difference. Okay, so let's remember that there are tiny differences that we can measure in signal transmission through cables. Which means that to say that we hear a difference is not the result of bias necessarily. It could very well be that we are just hearing a different pattern. Now a placebo is any medical or psychological intervention or treatment that is believed to be inert. Okay, this use of inert here means that this intervention or this treatment condition that we have that is the placebo is understood to not create an actual physiological or physical change okay it's shooting a blank basically all right so these placebos then are valuable as control conditions against which to compare the intervention of the actual treatment or change of interest now it's important to define this because two different cables again both by theory and by measurement even if the differences between them are very small are not an inert difference okay we don't have a true no change option versus a change option we have two different change options so to speak so placebo really doesn't even apply Let's make sure that we understand the placebo effect a little bit. And I copied a block of text here from the citation, the, the published scientific paper, paper you see down in the lower left. You can pause the video and read that if you wish. But I'm going to argue that the main points of this text tell us this, that again, the placebo effect depends on having an inert treatment. In the context of audio cables, we do not have an inert treatment. Now, we might, if we were actually testing two truly identical cables, we could possibly have something like a placebo effect going on. But the problem there is placebo effect is really more about medicine and clinical interventions and treatments. Applying it to audio is just taking it out of context. I can find no documented evidence anywhere about anything like a placebo effect being confirmed and being used as an explanation for perceived differences in anything outside of clinical treatments. Also, to claim placebo effect requires a lot of direct evidence that the placebo is what's happening. We either have to set up a study where we intentionally use a placebo and then show that the measured results 
are either present or exacerbated because of the presence of a placebo, or we have to set up a study that is looking for the placebo effect itself. We are not doing that when we talk about the differences between audio cables or any two pieces of sound gear. So I am going to argue that within our hobby, we simply need to stop using the terms placebo and placebo effect. They do not apply. They are not being used appropriately. They are not understood appropriately, and they are only clouding the issue. Please stop using it. Okay, I'm going to speak to some of the people out there who more or less agree with me in terms of, yes, we can hear differences in audio cables because I think there are some statements made that are equally unhelpful on this side of the camp. So to the cable believers, please stop saying that you don't care about measurements, you still hear a difference. Please stop saying that you don't care about A-B testing results, you still hear a difference. These are not helpful statements, okay? Science matters, measurements matter, A-B testing matters. It just so happens that the measurements and the A-B testing, believe it or not, do work in our favor, and I'm going to explain why, okay, here in this video. But denying that measurements are important, denying that science is important in this context, saying you don't care what the evidence say, you just go with your own ears, is really not helpful and is just as much science denial as the cable deniers saying there is no difference. Okay, it's not helpful, stop doing it. All right, so this is why I think we need a completely new way of thinking about this problem. Up to this point, we measure like energy differences in terms of volts or microvolts. Sometimes we convert that to decibels, but either of those scales, voltage or decibel, really are just proxies for differences in amounts of energy, okay? I'm going to argue that our brains don't perceive things that way and that measuring them in that way and trying to relate them to our perceptions and how our brains work doesn't fit. We're looking at two different ways of analyzing and perceiving and observing signals and sounds and things of that nature. Okay. How do human brains work? Back in the mid 20th century, computers were first rolling out and computer engineers and programmers realized that interacting with a computer was a challenge. You had to have very specific machine language that was very, very difficult for humans to understand and learn and operate within. So those computer engineers and programmers went to psychologists and neuroscientists and said, hey, how does the brain work insofar as how can we make interacting with a computer more like interacting with another person? And the scientists kind of looked at them and said, that's a really good question. And so those neuroscientists went back to their little world and started pondering the question, how does the human brain work in such a way that we can A, describe it, and then B, possibly replicate its function so that interacting with a machine is much more like interacting with a person? And what they came up with was the idea of pattern recognition. And they discovered that our brains work by recognizing and, an and analyzing patterns. So let's explore that idea further. Let's define some terms here. Pattern recognition. What is a pattern? In an everyday language sense, a pattern is often understood to be something that repeats in regular and predictable ways. And we see them happen over and over and over again. 
in a scientific sense, another good definition is that a pattern is a model form proposed for imitation. It is an archetype or an exemplar. Okay, it is the sometimes, if you will, an ideal form. It is an entity that is used to compare other similar or maybe slightly different things to. Human brains are very likely the best pattern recognizers on the planet. I mentioned our technology has yet to match our pattern recognition abilities. Okay, we have been trying to model artificial intelligence on our pattern recognition ability. We haven't gotten there yet. Don't believe me? Try any kind of speech to text software that is out there and see how well it goes. All right. But pattern recognition also is a fundamental way in which we make sense of the world around us. And it's really nearly impossible to oversell how foundationally important pattern recognition and pattern analysis is to how our brains work and how we understand what is going on in the world around us. What do I mean by that? Let's think for a moment about the concept of face. And I'm going to put a picture of a human face on here picked completely at random for no particular reason. All right, let's analyze this concept face. When we think face, we subconsciously realize that, hey, the face is located on the front of the head and thus is on kind of the top or front portion of the body. Furthermore, the face itself is made up of eyes, nose, mouth, all in some proximity to each other, some spatial relative positioning to each other. And so we can detect faces based on those features when the person looks different when the person is maybe yet of a different color or a different sex or a different gender or anything like that, or the person of a, of a different age, or the person is made up to be a fictional character. In fact, the features that we detect to, to determine what a face is and to recognize a face are so powerful and so common that we even recognize parts of the bodies of other species that are the faces. We recognize the face of a dog, no problem, or of a lizard, no problem, or of a dolphin, no problem. And dolphin is interesting because the sort of equal part or the analogous part of the, what the dolphin has to a nose has a different function. The dolphin does not breathe through the part of its face that looks most like nose. It breathes through a different part of its body, but it still has enough of the features in the right orientations and in the right place on its body that no one gets confused about where a dolphin's face is. But even when faces look kind of goofy, we still recognize what part is the face. Okay. We can even recognize very cartoonish representations of face. And indeed in this cartoon, we recognize like a whole human body, two of them in fact, in this cartoon. And we recognize that A, it is very, like it is not a realistic portrayal we recognize it's not supposed to be a realistic portrayal, but we also see the common features that we need to determine what's what. And we say, okay, yeah, there are two humans here and they have faces. And then pattern recognition goes even further by recognizing that they are somewhere out in the wilderness. Okay, they're being attacked by insects and so on and so forth. That's all pattern recognition. Now, not only does our pattern recognition allow us to see similarities and commonalities in things so that we can recognize that pattern everywhere, it allows us to see subtle differences within very similar patterns too. 
So here is a picture of two different people, and we can recognize immediately that they look very similar, but we can still tell that they are not the same person. Both of those abilities, the ability to say, oh, they look very similar, but then also to be able to tell that they are different is pattern recognition. We can even see a pattern in the change over time of a pattern. So here is a familiar face at four different instances in time. Our pattern recognition allows us to see that, oh, that's the same face, but it is also changing. Okay, pattern recognition. Again, difficult to oversell how fundamentally and foundationally important pattern recognition is to human cognition. All right, it works by feature detection. So in other words, human brains recognize things based on collections of features organized in certain ways. So if we get enough features present in sufficient proximity to each other, we will recognize a familiar thing, even if there are changes to that familiar thing. Okay, all of these images here, we look at and say, okay, there are definitely some common features going on here. We have this like central support stem-like thing. We have all of these other well branch-like things coming off of that central support. And then those branch-like things branch out even more. And most of them have like this green stuff on them, but that green stuff is a little bit different. But there's one that doesn't have that green stuff, but it looks like it probably would. It just for whatever reason doesn't have it right now, okay? And so forth. But all of those things are features that tell our brains tree, okay? We recognize a couple of things about all six of these images here. One, they are all tree. Two, they are all a little bit different tree. Maybe very different tree, but all still tree. Pattern recognition is extremely powerful. Here is a picture of a cloud. Here is a picture of a wooden fence slat. Now your pattern recognition Good chance, anyway, that it sees a rabbit in that cloud. In the fence, a couple of options. You might see a dog cocking its head to one side, or maybe you see a sad bear. But again, pattern recognition is extremely powerful and sometimes overactive and allows us to see things in sufficient proximity to each other that look sufficiently familiar that we will start to see patterns sometimes when those patterns aren't even there. Now we've talked about visual patterns to this point. However, sounds are patterns too. I bet that you can recognize what's going on in each of these sound clips. You've probably heard that before. You're probably like, oh, yep, there's a storm outside. Someone please give that baby some attention. It is unhappy. Hmm, maybe the mail just got delivered. Or we've got a package. Maybe the food's here. Point is, someone is at the door. And interestingly enough, the dogs recognized that someone was at the door. They knew that pattern. And they gave you another pattern that suggested you need to investigate what's going on. Uh-oh, get the broom in the dustpan because we just broke some glass. Sounds are patterns too. So how is it that humans can do verbal language to an extent that other animal species cannot do? It's pattern recognition. Really, let's just stare at this blank screen for a moment. And just from a cold, unfeeling scientific perspective, talk about what's going on. 
Right now, there is a big hairy ape talking into a microphone. Basically, he's just grunting and hissing a bunch. Our modern technology has figured out how to encode and transmit those grunts and hisses to other apes of various size and hairiness. And the devices that those apes have, be they computers or smartphones or tablets or smart TVs or whatever, are replaying those grunts and hisses. And when the big hairy ape on this end and the apes of variable size and hairiness on the other ends agree on the meanings of those grunts and hisses to a certain extent, we have communication. It's pattern recognition. That's what's going on here. You have even recognized the things on the screen in the slides that I have shown you because pattern recognition. Now, we are not the only species that can recognize patterns. Nina, is it time for a walk? Hmm? Is it time for a walk? Is it, is it time for a walk? Is it? Okay, we'll get ready to go. Okay, but we are the best at it. One of the points here is that pattern recognition is a key feature of how basically most, if not all of the species on this planet recognize things and are able to identify their food, perceive danger, perceive safety, so on and so forth. Like it is a foundational aspect. And what if, for whatever reason, the evolution has found that allows us to recognize and process through things. But yes, we humans on this planet are the best at it. What is music then? I'm going to let this guy explain it. Music. We listen to it. We love it. But what is it? I have come to understand music as the creative assembly of patterns of sound. When you think about it, every note, every chord, every instrument, every voice has its own unique pattern of sound. Then things like rhythms and melodies are patterns of those patterns. For whatever reason, we humans have been putting together these patterns of sound in unique and interesting ways all throughout our history and all over the world. We seem to have a deep and profound connection with these patterns of sound that we call music. So that's my quick definition of music. I am Wave Theory. I'm doing this new YouTube short series where I define audiophile terms and I thought it was important to talk about music. Please comment on any terms you would like me to talk about and as always, enjoy the music. I have it on good authority, by the way, that that guy really would appreciate if you watch his shorts series and uh, subscribe to his channel. All right, but that's music, patterns of sound assembled in creative ways. Now, it's important to recognize that waves and sound waves are themselves patterns. Okay, so we transmit sound waves, which are patterns, in electrical waves, which are themselves patterns. And we talked about in part three, how we can change that pattern by having different electrical and conductive properties of different materials. And that comes back to the question, can we perceive these tiny differences? And this is where I think pattern recognition becomes really important. To hear the very subtle differences that exist between two cables requires a few things, okay? Because there are really tiny differences in signal patterns. We've measured these, okay, between cables, but we have often interpreted those differences as simply being noise, which in some cases is true. But even when we're able to get to a higher resolution, we find that there is more than just noise going on. There are differences. And it's important to remember that our auditory systems do not hear microvolts. Our brains are not programmed to detect microvolts. They perceive patterns. Our brains recognize and analyze patterns. So it is the strength of our pattern recognition abilities that says, suggest we are in fact able to hear tiny differences in these patterns that come through different cables. 
All right, to recognize a pattern, some things have to be true. Okay, first, we must have enough pieces of the key features of that pattern stored somewhere in our memory. So how do those key features get into our brains in the first place? Really, the answer to that is we just have to live and experience things. Okay, it's really no more complicated than that because in the process of doing that, we will eventually start to collect little bits of knowledge knowledge and experiential memory and that sort of thing in our brains so that when any new stimulus comes along our brain is our brains are going to do this subconscious process of saying hey what are the key features of this new stimulus that i recognize and then it's going to attach meaning to that and then tag it in essence as similar to other pre-existing bits of knowledge and experience that are already in our brains and it's going to keep building a library like that over time so then once these things are in there what effects do they have so again our brains do this process automatically we activate little bits of knowledge knowledge and memories and patterns in response to a stimulus now we unfortunately have no conscious control over this process it's automatic, it's subconscious, our brains just do it for us. All right, but the cluster of these little bits constitute how we frame an experience. And our framing influences what new bits of sensory input are deemed most important, which ones get stuck to old bits, Okay, and which ones are useful and stored in the long-term memory. So that also means that our framing has a big impact on what we are able to perceive and remember. Okay, and again, I'm not blaming anyone for how they think in, reg in, res uh, in regard to this process. This is an automatic subconscious. We have no control over this process. It is a, a consequence of how we have evolved and how, how our brains and our cognitive functions function. Let's do a quick exercise though. Pizza. What kinds of things did that call up? You might have pictured something that looks a lot like this. And then upon seeing this picture, you might say, well, there's not enough vegetables on that. Or, hey, where's the sausage? or no that crust is too thick or it's too thin or maybe you started arguing with yourself about whether it should be new york style or chicago style or maybe you remember a time where you bit into a piece of pizza and it was way too hot and you burned your mouth or maybe you were having pizza with your college buddy and he was kind of a slob and he picked up a slice and wasn't careful and all of the toppings spilled out onto his shirt and it was hilarious okay but all of those things are things that you might possibly remember when you think of pizza that's framing that is your brain calling up all of the things that it deems relevant to pizza and that's also in part determining what kinds of new things that you can experience and how you are going to perceive them because of your framing of pizza so let's talk about not hearing subtle differences in cables so remember, in reality, there are those tiny differences in signal patterns transmitted through different cables. And the strength of our pattern recognition is what is, explains how we can, in fact, perceive those. But it also explains how we often miss those tiny differences. All right, so let's talk about how we could fail to recognize these patterns. So if we fail to recognize any pattern, let alone differences between two signal cables, it's most likely because we either do not yet possess knowledge of enough of the key features of that pattern to perceive that it is a pattern, it's just completely new and foreign to us, so our brain doesn't even pick it up, or our brains have actually overactivated our pattern recognition, blinding us to some aspect of what's actually happening there going to unpack this a little bit in just a moment. However, point two here is related 
to the fact that a suggestion or an expectation of recognizing a pattern can in fact cause us to recognize patterns that are not there. We'll handle that in just a moment. But it's also worth noting here, because we're talking about audio and sound and listening to music and all of that stuff, that the MP3 format and similar compression schemes use a lot of point two here. They ask the question, how many of the key features can we hang on to so that a brain that hears the output of this file recognizes what it's supposed to be and then get rid of, rid of the rest of the information. That's essentially what they are doing. They are leveraging our pattern recognition in order to, to say, we need this much data and we don't need the rest. All right, let's look at some examples and pull all of this together, hopefully. This is a picture of a mountainside. Kind of cool, huh? But why would I show you this? Well, Sometimes our brain just needs a little push to perceive a difference that it's not picking up on its own. There's a leopard in this picture. Go ahead and pause the video. See if you can find it. Okay, you back? Where's the leopard? Right there. Hello, Mr. Leopard. All right, so you may not have seen that leopard initially, but once I said there's a leopard in there, your brain thought of, oh, cat-like pattern, where is it? And probably went looking for it, and maybe it found it, maybe it didn't yet. But if you found it, it might have just been because your brain needed a little push to perceive something that it was not seeing on its own. So it's worth saying that hearing or perceiving a difference between things is actually only due to a bias or is the result of bias only if there is no difference. Okay, that's important to remember. You probably can't not see the leopard now. Now that your brain knows it's there, knows where it is, probably jumps right to it. All right, so we just gave the brain a little push, said, hey, this thing might be there. Now giving that little push is again, only a problem if that difference or that thing wasn't actually there. Now, it is fair to say that this push might cause us to see leopards everywhere until we find the real one, but it does not change the fact that there is a leopard in that picture and that that leopard is in a certain place in the picture. Okay, so if there is bias here as a result of this, it could be that we are biasing ourselves to perceive more than what's there, but bias itself is not causing us to perceive the difference in the first place if there actually is a difference there, and there is. However, for our brains, it's a double-edged sword, okay? can go both ways here and it's tricky because our brains can be fooled into thinking things are there that are not, or they can be so sure of what they see that they miss what's really going on. And preventing either of these outcomes takes effort, it takes practice, and frankly, it takes some humility. You have to put your feelings and all of that aside and say, maybe I don't know what's really going on and I need to pay super close attention and be ready to perceive an actual outcome regardless of what that actual outcome might be. For sound, missing things in sound, I think is a lot like camouflage. Okay, so I've mentioned in this video how evolution, mother nature, and all of that has used pattern recognition as a foundational way to make brains work across species. Evolution has also messed with our pattern recognition a whole lot, not just ours. It just messes with pattern recognition for advantageous region, reasons for a lot of species. There is an octopus in this picture, but you would be forgiven if you didn't see it right away because it has blended in to the surrounding environment really well. Okay, camouflage. There is a pattern of octopus in this picture, but you may have missed it. This is a picture of a tree stump. 
No, really. It is a picture of a tree stump. Oh, wait. There's a bird in this picture. Oh, wait again. There's another bird in this picture. Oh, my goodness. It's not just a picture of a tree stump. It is a tree stump with two birds. Now, what's interesting here is that if you initially look at this picture, you might look at it and say, oh, tree stump, and just move on. Your brain says, oh, I know what that is. And it just doesn't pay attention any further, and it moves on to process the next thing. Then you might see one of the birds and go, oh, okay, that's a bird camouflaged in with a tree stump. That's cool. I know what's going on now. I'm going to move on. Then your brain might say, oh, okay, actually there's two birds in this tree stump. I now know what's going on. I'm going to move on. Only if you pay really close attention and think long and hard about it would you realize, oh, okay, we actually have a tree stump going on here. Two birds. Those two birds look very similar, but they're also different and distinct from each other. Our pattern recognition can be so good and so convincing sometimes that it will perceive a pattern and then the brain will go, oh, okay, I'm done with that. I don't need to pay attention to it anymore. And it will just gloss over actual real changes that might be there. Now, sound isn't really camouflage. We mostly think of camouflage as a visual thing, but I think it's a good analogy to go to what's going on here insofar as we see enough, or in the case of sound, we hear enough to recognize drum or cymbal or guitar, okay? or choir, something of that, the, that nature. And then our brain just says, okay, I'm done with that. I don't need to pay any more attention to it. I know what it is. What's the next thing? That the, then the brain doesn't stop to think about and take in the subtle differences between, okay, we have guitar A and guitar B, and they sound a little bit different because of whatever the, the change in pattern might be. Okay, we just gloss right over it. I think this is what's happening in a lot of A-B testing. A-B test participants either don't recognize that a pattern is there to be perceived, or there's enough of the pattern and they have enough of the familiarity with a pattern that their brain just goes, I know what that is, and then it's done. Okay, it takes some effort and some practice and experiencing things in some new ways at times to realize that, oh, actually those guitars sound a little bit different. And here's why. Okay, so the effect is like camouflage. Enough of the pattern is present that we stop and we say, I know what that is, and then we move on. Now, another tricky thing about sound patterns is they are inherently time dependent. To talk about sound means to talk about frequency, which means pitch. That's a number of events that's happening per an amount of time. So these patterns unfold in time for us. So we can't just like a visual pattern that we see on the right, continually look back and forth and say, okay, I see the differences right here next to each other. Sound is a little different and a little trickier because it inherently unfolds in time. So some level of memory is required to be able to perceive differences in sound. Let's unpack that a little bit. Many cable deniers will say that our sound memory is bad. Actually, I agree with that. Okay, but I'm also going to argue that really our sound memory is no worse off than our other types of memory, frankly. Our experiential memory the memory of the experiences that we have, whether they involve sound or not, just living, is also kind of bad, right? Like if you were a police detective and you were asking four people their perspective on an event that happened and they all told you exactly the same story right down to the last minute detail, would you believe them or would you think they were cooking something up? We expect variations in memory and to get slightly different stories from different people. 
but we do expect mostly the same plot, the same basic sequence and series of events. And that's because we know that our memories are suspect on a highly detailed level. So to say that our sound memory is bad is not particularly illuminating. Our memory is just bad. Right? Here's an image. Here's a similar image with a few changes. Did you catch them all? Did you catch them all? No. Because they went by too fast. Okay? So your visual memory isn't exactly the greatest on that either. Now, if we put these side by side, now you can start to see the differences. Like, look at the hands on the clock. Okay? Look at the cookie tray and the items on it. Look at the lollipop that the rabbit is holding or the cat. Maybe it's a cat. Boy, my pattern recognition just got confused on that one. And so forth. Okay? When that image is just up for a brief second, you don't catch all of the differences because our memory just doesn't work that way, right? We have to become really familiar with a pattern before we can perceive the changes in it. Now, maybe you caught a couple of the, the differences by the quick visual, okay? You can do that with sound too, but to catch them all, take some time and familiarity with the pattern. Our sound memory is bad. Is it really? And I think framing this in terms of memory is not necessarily useless, but it can be misleading when it comes to how good our brains can be at perceiving differences in patterns. Okay, think about it this way. How many words do you recognize by sound? Think about your auditory vocabulary and how many grunts and hisses, as I referred to them earlier, can you associate meaning to? And beyond that, how many sounds in just our experiential existence can you associate meaning to? Like I had examples in earlier in this slideshow of thunder and rain, a crying baby, a doorbell with dogs barking, breaking glass. How many other things out there can you get a fairly good idea of what's happening just by hearing it? Is our sound memory bad? How many people can you identify by the sound of their voice? Even if you're not with them face to face and you hear their voice through a crappy telephone speaker, can you still tell that it's your significant other, that it's your mom or your best friend at the other end of that phone call? Yeah, you can. And that was before we had caller ID and knew which voice to expect. How many songs can you name by hearing the opening bars or by hearing the chorus or the lead singer's voice, the lyrics to it, even without the music, the guitar styling, the drum styling, or the melody played in a completely different genre of music, like an orchestral cover of a heavy metal song? How many songs could you identify that way, just by hearing that melody, even in a completely different musical style. So yeah, okay, maybe our sound memory is bad, or maybe we're just conceptualizing this in an unhelpful way, okay? Because re exact recall, right down to the last detail, can be a challenge, but we can also become so familiar with a pattern that we can quickly and readily perceive differences to them, even if they are patterns of sound, because our brains are very, very good at perceiving and analyzing patterns. So what have we learned in this video? Well, I hope that we have learned that human cognition is heavily, heavily based on the recognition and analysis of patterns. Hopefully we have learned that the theory of pattern recognition explains both sides of this, how it is that we can hear subtle differences in audio cables, but also how we can miss those subtle differences so often. It takes 
effort. It takes practice, and honestly, it takes some humility and the willingness to see if there either are or are not differences between cables to become good at this. Now, in the next video, if you're not seeing the whole argument yet, I'm going to put the complete we can hear cables, differences in audio cables argument together in an explicit way. So tune in for part five where I do that. And as always, thanks for watching. Please like and subscribe and enjoy the music. I am Wave Theory. I'll catch you in the next one.